triumph versus tragedy, progression versus regression. These ideas are pervasive throughout cultures. When people truly believe in progress, they will do anything they can to obtain it. They will fight like hell to achieve it, even if that means drastically changing society as a whole. However, it is during this period of reconstruction when the idea of progress is at its most vulnerable. The beginning of the modern era in the South was no different, as many social programs that were initially meant to help the struggling communities were used to continue to legally oppress them. Nowhere was this more evident than the rapidly modernizing city of Atlanta. In the period following World War II, America was one of two major superpowers in the world. It was supposed to symbolize freedom and the ability to make something of yourself. However, racial tension lay deceptively under a false sense of progression in the country that was quickly entering the modern era. These issues led to the civil rights movement and its apparent successes. Despite this, we all know that the civil rights movement didn't end racism at all. It simply led to economic and political policies that weren't blatantly racist, but which its goal were racially driven. In many cases, policies that were advertised as helping the black community actually increased legal segregation and hurt said minorities. And nowhere was this more prevalent than the supposed civil rights capital of the South, Atlanta. In 1971, the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority, or MARTA, was founded. Its goal was to provide fast, easy, cheap, and reliable transportation throughout the city. However, all it has provided is a bleak scar on the city of Atlanta, one which reminds us all of the mistakes and racially driven history of the urban hotspot. In order to see where it all went wrong, we need to travel back all the way to 1940. Before the introduction of MARTA in 1965, the predominant form of public transport was a privately owned trolley company. In fact, from 1949 to 1952, Atlanta had the most max-sized trolley buses in the entire country. An overwhelming majority of public transit riders chose to use these buses, and around 80% of all ridership went towards them. These trolleys were rather effective, but the owner of these buses, Georgia Power, had been losing money since 1920, and in combination with the infamous Atlanta public transit strike of 1950, they were looking to get out of the transportation business. Thankfully for them, they got their wish. In 1950, four wealthy businessmen, Clement Evans, Granger Hansel, Edmund Brandon, and Leyland Anderson formed the Atlanta Transit Company and proceeded to buy out all of Georgia Power's assets in the public transit business. This was a huge mistake for them, as in 1959, the main American manufacturer of trolley buses, Marmon Harrington, seized production of the vehicle. Unable to replace their fleet of over 270 buses, the Atlanta Transit Company phased out their entire trolley bus system in 1962. With only a few diesel buses left in commission, prices soared, and suddenly, Atlanta had a public transit Atlanta was problem. booming, and was now one of the fastest growing cities in America. It was also becoming one of the most diverse cities, Due to the mass migration of the black population towards urban areas following the end of the civil rights movement. According to the Census Bureau, 51.4% of the Atlanta population was black, but city leaders were overwhelmingly white. But there was one problem, their lack of a public transportation system. All other major cities had one, and especially for a city that has been known as a supposed transportation hotspot since its founding, this was humiliating and unacceptable. Thus, in 1965, MARTA was conceived. The Georgia General Assembly had a goal. And that was to connect the five major counties, Clayton, Cobb, DeKalb, Fulton, and Gwinnett, with both rail transport as well as bus lines. Fulton County makes up around 90% of Metro Atlanta, and Cobb made up most of the populated suburbs on the outskirts. The racial divide between all of the counties was vast, and legal segregation was in full force. This is in part due to the vicious redlining following the Second World War that prohibited blacks from living in suburbia. In addition to this, there was a mass migration of white citizens from the city to the suburbs due to the Civil Rights Movement, and the increasingly black populace. From 1960 to 1980, over 160,000 white people left the city limits, nearly cutting the white population of the city in half. According to the 1970 census, 84% of all people living within Cobb County, the suburb of Atlanta, were white, and around 237,000 residents of Fulton were black, the 11th most per county in all of the United States. In fact, 38% of the vote in Fulton County was the black vote and politicians knew that that was more than enough to swing elections. Due to the fact that the overwhelming majority of the black community lived inside the city limits, and in combination with low car ownership rates in said community, they were the ones who were most affected by the lack of decent public transportation. They needed mobility, and politicians knew that. They also knew that the black vote would swing the election as to whether to create MARTA or not. So, those in favor advertised it all throughout the black community by promising cheaper fares and interconnectivity throughout all of Atlanta, including the suburbs. Leading up to the 1965 vote, MARTA promised a bus fare reduction from 40 cents to 7, which would boom the black economy and allow for more mobility. 
It was the increased mobility that worried the white population in Cobb County, as they wanted as few black residents in their community as possible. For this reason, Cobb County rejected the proposal, and to this day, there is no way to reach this predominantly white suburb using Marta. It was only after the vote to construct Marta had passed that the citizens of Atlanta learned that the state of Georgia hadn't yet decided how it was going to pay for the massive infrastructure project. In a panic, citizens from across the state voted to amend the Georgia Constitution to allow the state to pay for 10% of the total cost of the construction, with the rest provided by federal funding. In 1968, in an attempt to raise funding for the project, the citizens of all the four counties voted against the tax plan that would collect a property tax. When the vote was raised again in 1971, Clayton and Gwinnett counties both left the Marta hype train, pun intended, and suddenly only Fulton, DeKalb, and the city of Atlanta remained. The reason for this was that the legislators continued to advertise to the black communities that lived there, and they voted overwhelmingly to provide funding. Once more, a promise of mobility and economic growth for the black community that would supposedly come hand in hand with Marta swung the vote. The mayor at the time, Sam Massell, had this to say in a recent interview with Bob Harris for the University of Georgia's library about the benefits of MARTA for the black community. We worked hard at getting the referendum passed, and that is not only a brick and mortar improvement, but it's a human improvement of services, of social security, etc. Mobility is like man's fifth freedom, you know? And without that, you're in prison. The poor are in their neighborhoods. They can't get to shopping or to schools or church or parks or anything else. So it was extremely important, in my opinion, that we got it passed. And many hundreds of thousands of people use it daily, you know? So it's a good service. And I hope it gets expanded more and more. Of the five counties that Marta originally wished to connect, only two remained, and they were both in the city of Atlanta. Even more taxes were needed to fund the project, and with only the two counties backing, an increase in property tax just wouldn't cut it. Massel knew that the only way to be able to pay for Marta was to create a sales tax imposed onto Fulton and DeKalb, thus creating a subsidy that he wanted to use exclusively for the construction and operation of day-to-day -day activities. However, he didn't have that kind of jurisdiction. So, in order to get his plan passed, he had to have it voted on by the General Assembly, which contained a coalition of anti-Atlanta lawmakers from other parts of the state, and the solution seemed highly unlikely. But Massel was a determined man, and campaigned for his new tax plan tirelessly. In the same interview with Bob Harris, Massel described the struggle that he had trying to pass the sales tax in the General Committee. We had to get the state legislature to allow us to put on a sales tax, and at the time, no city, no county authority, Board of Education, or anybody else had a sales tax, just the state of Georgia, 3%. And we had to convince them to let an authority have a sales tax. However, the tax still hadn't been made official, as voters still had to decide whether to pay it or not. Massel continued his tireless campaign, trying to convince voters to ratify the sales tax and make it completely official. He promised thousands of voters that if they said yes, he would immediately buy out the costly and failing bus companies. At the time, bus tickets in Atlanta were some of the most expensive in the entire nation, at 65 cents per ride. Massel promised that he would lower the cost all the way down to 15 cents per ride. In the months leading up to the vote, he could be seen riding buses, handing out flyers, and literally doing the math in front of hundreds of citizens at community centers in order to show them how they would be saving money due to the tax. In Bob Harris's interview, Massel describes the lengths he went to in order to swing voters. And then we had to convince the public to vote for it because it had to be a referendum and it only passed by a few hundred votes. And so anybody who helped, of course, could take full credit. I did some of everything trying to pass it. I even went up in a helicopter over the expressway during the rush hour with a PA system. You know, saying, if you want to get out of this mess, vote yes. And this being the Bible Belt, they thought that God was telling them what to do, you know? Like he said, Massel's tax plan was approved by only a few hundred votes. But even passing it was a monumental success. Finally, progress would be made and they all lived happily ever after. I'm just messing with y'all. Of course racist white politicians ruined it. Like I said before, it's when progress is achieved that tragedy loves to strike. And it did, in the form of segregationist Lester Maddox. Maddox was a man that openly opposed integration in the past, and he continued to support legal segregation. Oh, and he was also the majority leader of the Georgia Senate. When Massel met with him to talk about his sales tax plan before it was approved by the Georgia lawmakers, Maddox made Massel promise that less than 50% of the profits collected actually went to the operating and construction cost of MARTA. Because of this, MARTA is still to this day critically underfunded and has had to raise rates over the years just to pay the operating costs. As of right now, a one-way ticket on MARTA is $2.50, which is one of the most expensive tickets in the country. 